Peace, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Our movements for Black lives are interconnected. Today's global struggles for liberation are part of a continuum that each generation must carry to the next as we chip away at centuries of colonialism and oppression. The movement for Black lives based in the United States urges Afro descendants around the world to learn and to lean into the urgently needed solidarity at this moment. In the United States, we are digging into liberation and abolition in the face of extreme backlash from our Juneteenth 2020 uprisings that brought our community to the streets to push policy demands that invest in public health, care, community, instead of militarization, criminalization, incarceration, and police. Attacks on our voting rights, critical race, critical race theory, defund the police, and bail reform which is the fight to end money bail in the United States that functions as a ransom for poor people when they come in contact with the criminal justice system, are being attacked at every level of society and government. But we are steadfast. Global fascism threatens all Black lives. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and for your work in communities, especially in your communities. To our comrades in the diaspora, we are not born in Africa, but Africa is born in us. Always remember that out of many, we are one, and we are one with our comrades in the Sudan. Many groups have come together today to make this event possible. It is co-sponsored by Africa is a Country, Haymarket Books, The Internationalism from Below, Jadada Lia, Review of African Political Economy, Spring Magazine, Sudan Uprising Germany, DSA Afro-Socialist and Socialist of Color Caucus, the DSA International Committee, and the following departments at Bryn Mawr College, Africana Studies, Latin American, Iberian and Latino Studies, and Middle Eastern Studies, and the Political Science Department. There is so much to learn today. Please lean in and be ready to share questions and also to share your work. I wanna introduce our speakers today. First, Abdul Salam Mandas is an ag agronomist with a bachelor's degree in agricultural studies from Sudan University of Science and Technology. He is the official spokesperson for the coordination of the Obadma Resistance Committee and one of the two official spokespersons for the resistance committees in greater Umdarman. Our second speaker is Mohammed Salah Abdel Rahman, and he is a researcher and activist from Sudan who is affiliated with the Collective of Demand Based Organization, also known by its Arabic acronym TAM. He's a graduate of he's a graduate of chemistry from University of Khartoum and has published the book The Price of Gold which sheds light on the human and environmental costs of mining in communities affected by gold mining in Sudan. Our fearless leader and co-moderator is Muzan Anel Alnil, and she is the co-founder of the Innovation, Science and Technology Think Tank for the People-Centered Development in Sudan, and a non-resident fellow at the Tahia Institute for Middle Eastern Policy also known as the TIMEP, focusing in on a people-centered approach to economy, industry, and the environment in Sudan. Her recent writings include the people of Sudan don't want to share power with their military oppressors, fire. Also, why the Burham Hamdok deal was not stabilized, Sudan. And finally, the West is waging war on the Sudanese revolution. Without further ado, I want to introduce my sister, Muzan. Thank you very much, Munifa, and hello, everyone. Uh, well, let me first uh, properly introduce my co-moderator, Munifa Vandeli. 
Um, Munifa sits on the policy table leadership team for the Movement for Black Lives, as well as the steering committee of the New York-based communities um, United for Police Reform, representing the Malcolm X grassroots movement in both coalitions. Um, just in the past decade, she led the launch of two historic and successful um, um, cases against police misconduct, that's Daniels versus New York City and Floyd versus New York City, and worked to pass landmark police reform legislation in New York City and New York State. Um, and was a contributing writer to the Movement for Black Lives, Vision for Black Lives, and the Brief Act. I would also like to deeply thank Sean Larson from Haymarket for all his behind-the-scene technical work that uh, made this complex event possible. And um, in addition, I would like to thank Ismail Kushkush, uh, who is the interpreter today, and who makes it possible to hear these important voices from Sudan's revolution. Um, I would also like to salute everyone who joined the event. Um, by being here, we are actually uh, fighting systematic actions designed um, to eliminate the chances of such exchanges of revolutionary experiences and lessons and solidarity. So to be here, that's something that we deserve to be proud of and to celebrate. So thank you for being part of it. Now, I will try in the coming few minutes to um, provide a brief record of the past three years leading to the second uh, wave of the Sudanese revolution before passing the microphone to the great speakers that uh, I'm sure we're all um, very eager to hear from. Um, in December 2018, um, the revolution, it was a revolution that built on decades. Um, uh, of a struggle uh, fighting a 30 years uh, dictatorship. And it was ignited by the protest of high school students um, uh, protesting the increase of bread prices. Um, this process, protest then was followed by protests all over the country, all over Sudan. People were angry at the economic policies that impoverished millions, and they were ready to take to the streets. Um, so uh, for a month, um, for six months, actually, protests in cities and villages were called for by the Sudanese Professionals Association and organized by the neighborhood resistance committees um, that um, our speaker, Mindas, will tell us more about. Um, those protests escalated to a 58-day sit-in um, around the military headquarters in 14 cities in Sudan, demanding a civilian government and an end of military rule. Um, it led to the overthrow of the dictator, but the military remained in control. Um, the the sit-in was um, a, a glorious revolutionary display that was ended brutally uh, by the state forces um, on June 3rd, uh, 2019, uh, the massacre of June 3rd, uh, where on that day, more than 100 were killed, more than 40 bodies were thrown into the River Nile, more than 70 people were raped, um, hundreds were missing on that day and remain missing up until now, and thousands were injured. Uh, despite the violence, um, in four weeks from that horrible day, the Sudanese uh, protesters organized again and walked the streets in a millions march um, in over 20 cities, um, uh, demanding a civilian uh, government that answers to their interests. Um, they were not only fighting the military, but they were also fighting a, um, a group of regional and international counter-revolution powers, um, the usual players. So you have the United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi, the UK, and of course the United States of America. We're all pushing for uh, a partnership, a civilian military partnership, uh, and basically rewarding the military's massacre uh, with, this, with a seat uh, in power. And that partnership took place. It governed Sudan um, for two years. Uh, and over those two years, it was a government that furthered the, the same neoliberal economic policies of the dictator. So so instead of a decent living, living, what the Sudanese people got out of it was more increases in prices. And instead of protection from the impacts of gold mining or oil extraction, uh, there was further uh, prioritization of business interests over people's lives. But it was, of course, all applauded and approved by the international community. However, great things also happened those during those two years. The people did not stop organizing in resistance committees or in demand-based uh, organizations and many other forms. And these organizations walk the very fine line of pushing for the revolutionary demands while maintaining a situation where uh, their narrative cannot be used by the military to justify a coup over the half-civilian government that was presented as a step towards a fully civilian government. However, on October uh, 2021, a few months ago, a coup took place nevertheless. Um, army vehicles were in the streets. 
communications shut down, the cabinet um, detained. However, the masses went out on the streets, utilizing the tools of peaceful demonstration that by then they knew and experienced very well. Um, protests, barricades, uh, chants, uh, and burning tires took over the streets on that day, and they still do up until today. Um, a second wave uh, of the Sudanese revolution started and it does not seem like it will stop. Um, the, the military on the other side fought these peaceful demonstrations, um, killing more than 70 protesters over the past 114 days uh, while and um, uh, injuring hundreds and, and detaining hundreds as well. Um, the, 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 the demonstrations did not stop, uh, including 18 rounds of marches of millions, each of which um, um, took place in at least 17 uh, cities simultaneously, organized by the resistance committees. We'll talk about it soon. The main slogan um, of, the, of the second uprising is the three no's. So that is no negotiation, no partnership, and no legitimacy for the military, um, indicating a more radical approach against the military than we had in the first um, uprising. And here we are today, 114 days later, the military is still not able, with all its violence, to stop the peaceful demonstration, not able to appoint um, a cabinet or uh, even been a prime minister. It is being defeated by the organized resistance of the people. And that's where we are today. Um, let me stop here and uh, bring in our first speaker, Mindas. And uh, um, I'll be asking the questions uh, in English and, and, then in, uh, and then in Arabic. So Mindas, uh, we'd like you to tell us about the neighborhood resistance committees. Um, uh, for those who don't know Sudan, what are the resistance committees and what is their role in the current wave of the revolution? Uh, yeah, Mindas, with us, the listeners don't know a lot about Sudan. So what is the role of the resistance committees and what is the role of the resistance committees? آه، اوكي في البداية آه، شكرا لكل الذين جعلوا حاجة ممكن آه، رباب سارة دوحة موزن النيل آه، سين لارسون شان اسماعيل منيفة all thanks to you glory to our martyrs in Sudan and a speedy recovery for all those injured in the Sudanese revolution and we do not forget to salute African American during Black History Month. And we salute all the sacrifices of Black Americans. Frederick Douglass, and those, and the idea of Black History Month, the solidarity of peoples is connected, that can dictate its path. Against the states that if we go back to the resistance committees, they are grassroots organizations that are a, a part of Sudan's legacy of liberation that were in response to or necessity to respond to the policies of the state against that dismantled the syndicates, labor syndicates of the past and this was a necessity in, to respond to that directly or indirectly that the history of these resistance committees are are grassroots organizations the democratic, popular demo, democratic, that guarantee the involvement of all in policy makings in a way that um, challenges uh, the modes of organization of the state 
in certain ways in the resistance committees since the beginning were a, a connection or a continuation of non-governmental organizations. And they appeared during the Sudanese revolution December 2018, and until today, the resistance committees continue to grow and develop organizationally in different ways. The question back then, questions of security and the tactics of how to organize in a proper way and how to um, distribute different roles of organizing and to expand the base of the movement. So the resistance committees to move from movements within neighborhoods and then there was a coordinating committee of resistance committees that expanded to uh, all states of Sudan to connect the different Sudanese youth and at different levels, theoretically, demands were different from one committee to another and that would develop that the ceiling of demands were high in certain areas and different from the demands or when unable to express those demands, but there was it became clear later on. And this is one of the characteristics of the De December revolution that the resistance committees that included um, youth, young men and young women that would renew its methods of organizing and to be update to up to date with the street and and to guarantee that it would create a collective lit leadership. in creating policies to guarantee the transformation of societies who are involved in the uh, policy making and being a part of the distribution of wealth and power and that represents popular involvement if we go back to why the resistance committees i pointed to that previous governments consecutive governments in sudan since independence in 1956 civil, civil service was destroyed in 
where the state ha had no role or less of a role in public life and where syndicates came became involved. So the youth organized alternatives to these syndicates as there was a deliberate destruction of syndicates and non-governmental organizations. Sudan went through two periods of, of colonialism. First, Ottoman Egyptian colonialism, 1821 to 1885. Then Anglo-Egyptian colonialism, 1899 to independence, December 1955. These two colonial eras went Um, created a situation where um, low-cost colonial rule and now with the, with the military with military rule Ottoman colonialism created native administration that helped in collecting taxes for the benefit of the colonial power. Then you had the British colonial rule. After Sudanese nationalist officers revolted in 1924, The, the White League flag movement, Anglo-Egyptian colonial rule, helped created native administration again to control the movement of the Effendia class. Then the Anglo-Egyptian rule created Sudan Defense Force. And it was necessary to deconstruct these inherited colonial structures native administration and throughout the history of Sudan if we look at the military establishment have ruled 55 years since Sudan's independence which has been independent for 66 years so only Sudan has had experienced only seven years of democratic rule since independence. And they were strategic allies, consecutive governments since the creation of the modern Sudan since December 1955. All democratic forces that seek a modern democratic Sudan. And this appeared when General Ibrahim Aboud tried to create forces that would combat rebel movements and during the so-called third democratic period, 
when the government of Prime Minister Sadiq al-Mahdi used militias that were responsible for the massacre of Al-Da'in, one of the famous massacres in Sudan, and reintroduced or revived slavery order And this was also created during the reign of dictator al-Bashir as a Jinjaweed through the native administration and and we saw the emergence of a leader of the native administration Musa Hilal And then we, native administration, even during the transitional period, were that some pointed to the native administration as a base for support. The, the Sudanese army these two institutions to help the colonial state in Sudan, whether the Ottoman Egyptian or the Anglo Egyptian. And these two institutions continue to do what the colonial state did. This is why we see that the native administration and the Sudanese military, in the way it is today, create challenges for democratic transition. That's why the, the military in the way that it is today, or the native administration, these two institutions function to, to preserve their status and are challenged to democratic transition. That's why the resistance committees had a different view by the youth to create a genuine transition of Sudan where authority is linked to the hopes of Sudan and, and to create government to create the goals This is why, this is what created the resistance committee. And the role of the resistance committee since the revolution its major role was, was, was to push for large demonstrations and for revolutionary work, for work in the media, and talks. The role of the resistance committees after the sit-in in front of the army headquarters was to secure the sit-in and to make available services such as security and food at the sit-in June 3rd massacre 
that took place at the sit-in. One of the tools also was to protect neighborhoods. And to mobilize for a general strike. And the million marches The resistance committees had to change its roles to be to provide services with the lack of uh, services provided by the state, providing basic basic commodities, so it added to its initial role when people realized that the path of the revolution had changed and, and where you had uh, for example, in North Kurdufan state, the resistance committees would change in its priorities. And since the coup of October 25th, it has a completely different role. Before the coup, it, it sought to press the government to go back to the correct path. But when the transitional government failed, in the differences in the objectives between the government until the coup of October 25th, it, it, the, the new role became clear to end the coup and bring back power to the people. And it, in this era, the resistance committee went to its initial role December of 2018 to look into the transgression, human rights transgressions I will end here if there are questions we'll try to answer
Um, well, glad to be back. And uh, first, uh, thank you, Mindas, for such an informative answer. Um, actually, forms of organization are definitely among the top um, of revolutionary experiences to be shared and studied. Um, now, uh, while resistance committees were geographically based, uh, formed within neighborhoods, the Sudanese people had several struggles with the state uh, that required other forms of organization um, of people who shared uh, you know, socioeconomic realities and, and oppressions. And uh, that's where networks such as the gathering of demand-based organizations, uh, TAM, uh, comes in. Um, it's great to have Mohammed Salah here with us uh, who can tell us about it. Uh, Mohammed, what is TAM and what is its role um, in the revolution? Yeah, yeah Mohammed, TAM هو شنو؟ تجمع الإنسان المطلبية هو شنو؟ وما هو الدور اللي بيلعبه في الثورة؟ محمد كان هناك سامعنا محمد يعني تحية لكم ايوه خاص لكل المشاركين في تنظيم المتقدم ان نقدر الثورية الحية في السودان تعكس الواقع بتاع السودان وليروح بتاعت التضامن بين كل الحركات deliver the, the voice of the The, the, the beautiful introduction by Mindas reflects the, 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 author, the authoritarian role of the state and the role of the state and its connection to the places of production. The, the history of the Sudanese state is, it, is, it was a plutocanomic, a colonial policy in different eras that has tried to use, utilize in the post-colonial, the post-colonial state has tried the same in a more aggressive, to, to utilize human resources. And this shows in different areas of Sudanese history with the development of the economic, agricultural economic or, that does not benefit the, the life of ordinary citizens. And since independence, in, instead of turning into cooperative economies, This happened at the account of the owners of land. During the, the period of former president of Abud, the revolution of October, mechanical agriculture. This, that the owners of land in areas such as Nuba Mountains or Blue Nile, that they become labor in their own lands, providing services to the state in which people would, would call in, the, in those areas, the Jalaba, who own this introduction but also also the manipulation of nomads since the beginning or back to the the era of colonialism one of the incidents 1924 the, the great revolutionary incidents in Sudan where a 
Arab groups in Western Sudan were mobilized. So if we look into the old history during colonial period, there was always a history of resistance in response to different policies. So farmers organized themselves in different er areas, such as Managin. And if we look at the bit, the Bija organized in, in form of the Bija Congress in the Nuba Mountains and in Darfur and other areas. Then it started to take a more national the collective of demand based groups. These various groups began to coordinate among themselves. And this organizing developed after the revolution of 2013. Under the banner of a slogan, this land is ours. Who were against the idea of dams, the building or the construction of dams in Northern Sudan. Or in, uh, to the east in Adbar and City. Or in the, the areas of Sinar. Or port workers in Port Sudan that created a consciousness that these demands might appear in different forms in different ways. There is no way to address these demands without a political solution. This was not an easy process. We're different, we're talking about different societies, different demands that develop. The revolution helped create or to develop these demands in a faster way, especially during the days when the re revolution was working in different areas. Halfa, Abu Hamad. Once the villages of Al Jazeera. The, the success of the revolution in bringing down the head of the government. that looked into areas of mining where there were groups, where there were workers that were affected by the stealing of resources. Over 1 million citizens are affected or threatened by the drowning because of the creation of dams or the groups that were affected by land grabs. There are 17 groups that are affected by land grabs and mostly in the Eastern Nile areas, let alone those affected by affected by wars or IDPs, internally displaced persons, such as the group of the 29th of January in Port Sudan, or the families of the martyrs 
against the policies of the Inqaz government or those affected by the the stealing of oil resources the stealing of resources was affected by the there were villages where you could there were no longer births There was the weaponization of societies and societies resisted the role of these groups to date that don't follow the core modes of resistance that will resist in different ways authority in, in a different eras violence against citizens in areas such as Talodi or Blue Nile or other areas in, in a general way the Tam has called for the end of the coup and widening the, the grassroots space. The the path that the resistance committees have have gone into sign on one of the interesting things is when the forces for freedom and change coalition saw the resistance committee saw in the policies forwarded by the forces for freedom and change a difference This is a, a, a simple introduction to Tam. That is made up of several bodies that is reorganizing itself to create, to help meet the goals of the revolution. of social economic uh, um, struggles uh, across geographies and across sectors um, and, and, and the way it's uh, contributing to, to the revolution in Sudan. I would like to go back to Mindas um, and ask about the resistance committees. Uh, given their rather non-hierarchical and their uh, fight, um, uh, non-hierarchical structure and their fight um, against a violent and criminal regime, uh, how, how do you do it? Um, so, what are the main strategies of your organizations in this, and how do you make decisions? And what are the biggest obstacles um, to the uh, to the work? Um, so, I'd like to ask about the Lijan. What are the strategies that you use to support the Lijan to make the decision? And what are the biggest obstacles that you face? Okay, thank you for the second time. 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 Thank you we're basically grassroots organizing. There's no leadership in the traditional sense. Where all are involved. It is like a, a, a co-op of syndicates Decision making takes a process because of the structure of the in contrast to 
traditional modes of organizing. This popular democracy. Decision making is done by everyone, but But we have committees and neighborhoods. Then you have coordinating committees between localities. The decisions are different where you have at the neighborhood level And then you have coordinated committee at the state level. Decision is made by, by all those involved in meetings where there's a general assembly. Then all the general assemblies, but, but at the coordinated committee at the state level or the regions, the decision making is done by representatives. Where you have direct representation. Then at a different level, the duties of of different resistance committees where there was a structural division those specialized in creating posters statements, some involved in mobilization. According to the circumstances, the structures within the different committees and their distribution of people in 2018 or after the uh, breakup of the season of 2019 or the ending of the, of the partnership of the transitional period. The, the decision-making is made according to the committee, and that depends on the structure of the committee, and it and accordingly it makes its decision. And the committee, for example, for people to consider what ways to organize and the view and how, how decisions are made. Thank you.
So, uh, Mindas and Mohammed, uh, you both gave us important details on organizing against injustices in Sudan. So, let's talk about how these injust injustices came to be to start with. Uh, let's talk about wealth creation and wealth distribution in Sudan. Uh, Mohammed, you are especially active with the groups that fight the security services involvement in the mining sector. Um, it is known that Sudan is the third biggest exporter of gold in Africa, but most of it is smuggled out of the country and doesn't benefit the communities. Uh, quite the opposite, opposite, as you showed in your book, uh, the price of gold, uh, the health and environmental impacts um, is a disaster. Um, and many mines are controlled by security services. Um, can you tell us about this this issue and, and how it's resisted, how the resistance deals uh, with it? And um, Mohamed, you're very interested and in the issue of the issue ومن المعروف ان السودان ثالث مصدر للذهب في افريقيا، لكن اغلبيه الذهب مهرب وما بتستفيد منه المجتمعات المحليه، بالعكس تعدين الذهب زي ما انت اثبتت في كتابك سعر الذهب عنده اثار مخيفه على البيئه وعلى صحه الناس، كمان عدد كبير من المناجم مستولي عليها الشركات الامنيه، ممكن تحدثنا زياده عن عن التعدين في السودان وعن المقاومه لاثار التعدين في السودان؟ شكرا جزيلا مرة ثانية زي ما ذكرتي التعديم في السودان Mining in Sudan is one of the large activities in Sudan For the longest Sudan was agriculture based and dependent on its animal wealth Since the independence of South Sudan, the, the economy of Sudan lost 90% of its foreign currency revenue. So it sought new sources which encouraged mining and the revenue of Sudan increased to where it is today, 100 tons. The, the policies of the Inqaz government was tied to violent conflicts. For example, in Darfur, as Mindans mentioned, where you saw traditional societies, groups involved connected to the National Congress Party. So for example, Sheikh Musa Hilal was linked to the authority in Khartoum and this, this is also is very similar to uh, what happens in the state of Southern Kurdufan or the area of Tolodi, the various military circles. So for example, there was a mining tied to intelligence and the defense forces, the popular defense forces. The, the structure of mining became tied to the state and not open, not even in a typical capitalist system. It is a economy of militias. From 2016, 2017, the intelligence services as the major economy, major controller of the economy, in order to protect the government of Inqaz, the transformation that has happened in Sudan from during the period of Bashir and then to the era of Hamdok or during the transitional period, 
that where that you have a a different company, a Jined, that are connected to the rapid support forces, the transformation that has happened. Sudan from a, a country producing 110 tons to the three periods before the fall of Bashir, Sudan had produced 18 tons People were aware that there was a much larger uh, production, but it was going to the uh, parallel economy. The parallel economy or the state of militias that fed the budgets. So where with the smuggling of gold, It became a, a legal cover for corruption. These, the impact of these security circles so for example intelligence it was supposed to implement the law but the opposite is in fact what was happening where intelligence was breaking the law so in, for example in the areas of South Kurdufan that it would break the laws the privatization of intelligence another side to this that there were environment, negative in, environmental impact where mercury was used largely without any regulation. And this is one of the uh, scenes where we see the impact of mining on humans and the environment. So the societies would resist the activities of mining. So in the area of Southern Kurdufan, for example, So in the area of Tertar, citizens refused mining and had citizens. Then the police came in, intelligence came. And wanted the corporations to work in these areas. But we saw imp impact on the environment, on the health. So for example, we saw the birth of a child So for, for an example, we, we saw citizens take a, a, a stillborn child to the very meeting and said that we are negotiating over the health of the people here. So in the area of Sawabla, that they had sit continuous citizens sit-ins over the years. So there were demands to the government to end the, the work of corporations in these areas. This has happened also in, in the area of Talodi. This resistance has taken 
place, different places, and in very creative ways. In many areas, So when at the time when uh, Bashir fell, there many citizens saw no difference between the fall of Bashir and the new government in how it affected the mining in their areas, because mining was an authority that killed people. to support the parallel state. So the military would support Sudanese minerals. So over 80% of this goes to the United Arab Emirates. This is what we call dirty mining. With the blood of those from the areas, and this requires the solidarity of people worldwide. So even the international forces to su help support Sudanese, there are allegations that even international forces in these areas are involved in this type of mining. I found that an international force in the, the region of Abye why are international forces in the state of South Kordofan belonging to forces that are supposed to be in the region of Abye where international forces are supposed to be? So citizens in these areas complained that there were forces that there were forces that were more similar to miners. So in the areas of South Kurdufan where we know that there are uranium in large quantities. We, we've searched that looking at photos before the arrival of international forces to how these areas looked before and how they look now. That there should be an investigation And, and some of these forces demanded to have presence in areas such as Aliri. But locals protested. And asked why was there a need for international forces in this area. So they local citizens look at these forces as forces that take from their resources. So for example, an activist in the area of Talodi was killed by an automobile. So th there, there are many legal transgressions and of human rights and contradictions of human rights and environmental conditions, which requires large solidarity 
revolutionary, live revolutionary forces and the International Committee. The collective of demand-based groups was created. Where various groups from the the very south of Sudan to the east of Sudan and to the very north of Sudan and seeking to involve the international committee where the locals are involved in mining even in the transactions in the agreements that are made on mining where there is a genuine partnership so the companies of intelligence services so one of the unfortunate things during the transitional period this is one of the great failures of the past period we can continue i'll stop here we can continue later on that uh, the mining sector in Sudan has every type of crime uh, possible, from assassinations to um, negative environmental impacts to even, as we just understood from you, even the uh, international peacekeeping missions seem to be mining um, inside Sudan, um, and we are not even aware um, who's facilitating this situation. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, my last question is to Mindas um, about a topic that uh, it's taken over the public debate and public discussion in Sudan right now, Mindas. Uh, that's the, the new unified political charter. Uh, we have heard, heard for some months that a unified political charter is being developed under the leadership of the resistance committees that will bring together uh, revolutionary forces um, in a common vision of political and economic changes in Sudan. So uh, how far along um, is this process and what are the main features of the charter? Uh, drafting of as I mentioned earlier that during the transitional period during the um, committees to restore the revolution in the area of Northern Kurdufan, the resistance committees were faced with a new reality to enter into the drafting of statements where it became major to develop its revolutionary agenda. That's why the resistance committees since the coup so starting from the area of Mayorno in Sinar State So the civil and to different levels to area, other areas such as Khartoum State no. 
and in, in different areas of the country, such as Madani, where different coordinating committees from different areas, Port Sudan, and in, and in the rural areas, Jinan, Uthayan, the IDP camps in Darfur reached an agreement to the political declaration. They were all part of these meetings. These forces adopted a honorary people's authority to negotiate with other resistance committees in other parts such as the northern state including the uh, resistance committees in Khartoum. To put the main points, how to retrieve authority and power during the transitional period, and how to fix the economic situation and, and how to construct sustainable peace, popular peace and transitional justice and how to uh, meet the demands of the families and the, er and the issues of such as population census, and what we are concentrating on right now that there were many mistakes in the past. That those who rose to power in the transitional period had different agendas. So issues such as gender representation was not widely adopted. More than the issues of suggested quotas. So even the suggested percentages so the division of power that would allow These are the, the ways that the agreements are heading to. Shukran, um, Thank you. I think it's great that you gave us uh, details into um, the process and as well as the lessons learned from the from the previous uh, declaration that was forced on on the Sudanese people and the Sudanese revolution by international and regional players and by the national elite as well, um, and how this is being fixed. Um, I think this is as important to study and document as the the charter that we'll see it, um, in the end. Um, we have um, um, some questions uh, that uh, from our audience uh, to both of you, Mohammed and Mindas. Um, unfortunately, we cannot go through all of them, but um, I think we can do one question each. Um, this question is um, to Mohammed, uh, the first one. Uh, well, um, 
the question is what concrete solidarity actions uh, do you need from outside Sudan that can help you continue the struggle and achieve the demands of the revolution? سؤالك يا محمد انه شنو هي اشكال التضامن او اجراءات التضامن الملموسه المطلوبه في رايك من من الناس خارج السودان اللي ممكن تساعد الثوار داخل السودان خاصه في النقاط اللي انت ذكرتها على مواصله هذا النضال وتحقيق مطالب الثوره. طيب شكرا جزيلا مره ثانيه حقيقه في يعني حاجات كثيره ممكن تحصل There are many things that can be done. Ways of solidarity. Countering the deconstruction of the state that has become the state of militias. And this is not just in Sudan, but in the African Sahel that have become dependent on parallel states established by militias that manipulate resources that in the post-colonial state that, that de- and this is an example worldwide and these militias have to so, so the militias in Sudan for example are tied to the militias in Libya or Chad or in Niger or even areas of Algeria, Mali, and are dependent on regional and international forces. So for example, in Southern Darfur, there are mining companies linked for example, to the Wagner Group that has activities throughout the Sahel regionally and widely. To confront the control of the militias on the resources is important. And where you have a place like the United Arab Emirates, which is the major import, importer of these resources, this needs international solidarity. One of the challenges for now, that there's a major change of the international role in Sudan Sudan once had the United Nations mission in Darfur, UNAMID. We are not dependent on international forces for change in Sudan, but we are dependent on the local revolutionary forces. But there's been a major change in Sudan with the United Nations. where UNAMID was there to protect citizens. With the arrival of the government, Abdullah Hamdok, we, we saw new politics. There was a plan to protect citizens in Darfur. And among the first people to resist this were the people in the IDP camps because the same forces supposedly to protect the citizens were the same groups responsible for creating the internally displaced persons. And where the current United Nations group So where, you, where we see the new forces there assaulted even the United Nations presence in Darfur. And 
and these are uh, internet. This international role is what we reject. The interference in the international, in, in Sudanese affairs, in this way is what we are against. A third point, and this will be my last point, these international roles are in fact regional are regional interferences, what I call an axis of evil in, in the region. What are the policies of these different circles such as the United States, the European Union, the free peoples of these areas need to question who is this, who does this benefit? And for those who want to support the Sudanese revolution, solidarity takes different shapes and forms, whether it be the families of the martyrs, But these are examples. Shukran, Hamid. Um, thank you, Hamid. Um, now, this question is to you, Mindas. Um, it says, um, um, can you touch on how the resistance committees are relating to the recent flux of women's rights and anti-sexual violence protests? So, uh, Alia, Mindas, is it possible to talk about the المقاومة بالحراك النسوي وحركات الاحتجاجات ضد ضد العنف الجنسي خاصة إنه أنت كممثل لأمبدة وقربة من من إعتصام داخلية الحجار اللي متواصل له أسابيع الآن إذا ممكن برضو تكلمنا بشكل يعني بالتحديد عن الحاجة أوكي طيب لجان المقاومة يعني according to its structure that has many youth in different areas of Sudan, that it follows the transgressions on the rights of Sudanese, including sexual assault, particularly issues of rape, And, and since the 25th of November, until recently, we've seen 29 cases of rape, including three in the capital Khartoum. One, the incident, uh, the Hajar dormitory at the Ahfad University and then areas in Darfur, such as Zamzam. We see that the same system of the transition, transgression of human rights in Sudan, that we see that the Official authorities are also involved. If we go back to the incident at the Hajar dormitory, where there was a rape inside the dormitory, it, it brought forward many questions regarding the administration of the dormitory. after the privatization of education in Sudan, what kind of services were provided to students? T 
typically no student, no female student would enter the dormitory without a ID card. But before the, the rape case, according to witnesses that there were thieves that entered that there was some coordination with members of the administration So according to the evidence that this negates the idea that there was no connection between those that entered the dormitory and between individuals within the dormitory's administration. So the students there are still resisting and this requires support and solidarity for this issue. Shukran um, Unfortunately, this will have to be our last question uh, since we are reaching the end of our event. Um, and this question is um, also to, to Mindas. Um, uh, the question is, um, is there any dialogue uh, with the traditional parties? Um, and how is this communication among the decentralized organization of the resistance committees? Mindas, a question is, is there any dialogue between the traditional parties? وكيف بيتم التواصل بين لجان المقاومة المختلفة على مستوى السودان ب ب بتركيبة الحالية دي؟ عموما لجان المقاومة. Resistance committees. After the coup of October 25th, has a different view from. its view of the, the past. It has a three no's, no legitimacy, no cooperation. The, the goal was not just to bring down the former government, but to bring down the system The state, as construction and built upon the idea of the military and the native administration after the colonial rule, where the political or order was built on traditional parties, that is built on the support of religious sects and native tribal administrations. As pointed to earlier, democratic transition in Sudan needs to reevaluate the role of traditional forces and the role of native administrations and the military. But as resistance committees, we negotiate 
within the various coordinating committees of the resistance committees. Shukran, ya Mindas. Um, thank you, Mohammed and Mindas. It is unfortunate that this conversation has to end, but I believe our speakers uh, provided us all with great insights, um, as well as an overview, uh, overview of the resistance and revolution in Sudan. Um, I would also like to highlight um, an important role uh, for the success of the Sudanese revolution that can only be done by the allies of the revolution um, outside Sudan. Um, and especially in countries uh, governed by the, the big players of the counter-revolution. Um, after the coup, it was, um, th it was the special envoy of the United States um, State Department uh, who said that it is unrealistic for the people of Sudan to demand an end of military rule. Um, and it was the General Secretary of the United Nations who um, urged us to accept another partnership with the military in what he called um, an appeal to common sense. And uh, those two were not alone in this. Um, uh, they are, the counter-revolutionary camp is full of governments, officials and diplomats who are um, working so hard um, to force a dialogue with the military killers um, with, and force a government of killers uh, actually on the people of Sudan. Um, they are providing legitimacy and narratives and justifications for the crimes of the military and this should be resisted. And uh, I ask of all of you um, to, to tell your governments and representatives, uh, please um, stop uh, these attempts of fabricating um, fake stability at the cost of our lives. Uh, the people of Sudan are creating a new reality uh, where stability depends on, the, on delivering the demands of the people and keeping the, the killers in check, not vice versa, which is what um, many of your governments are trying to force on us. Um, it will be great uh, if counter-revolutionary governments can step aside and stop protecting criminals. And I trust that you will convey the message. Uh, so for that and for your time, I thank you so much. Um, big thanks to our speakers and the organizing team. Um, uh, stay well. Um, that's all from my side. Um, um, and if anyone would actually uh, want to uh, engage in uh, Sudan solidarity work, you can contact internationalism from below. Um, that's all from my side, uh, but the revolution continues, and I pass it to Manifa. Thank you so much, my sister. I don't have much more to add other than to say that every single call for Black freedom has been called unrealistic. And it's, it is unrealistic until we win it. And we will win it as long as we realize our Pan-African and our global African solidarity. So everyone listening around the world, Sudan needs you, Sudan needs you now. <laughs>